Good evening and welcome to Rainbow Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible study. I'm so glad that you are here and am excited about our study tonight uh, in the book of 1 John. We are on week three of our series in the book of 1 John and tonight's topic is a big one. Uh, In this portion of scripture that we're going to be looking at, John is talking about how Christians are supposed to treat one another. Uh, But before we get into our study in 1 John, I actually want to start off in the gospel of John. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and be opening those up to John chapter 13. And the reason that we're starting in the gospel of John uh, is because in the book of 1 John, Uh, He is actually referencing something that he witnessed uh, during his time with Jesus. So what we're going to do first is we're going to go to uh, the gospel of John. We're going to be in John chapter 13. We're going to look at this thing that he witnessed, and then we're going to jump ahead to 1 John and do our study and uh, and see what it has to say for us tonight. So uh, we're going to be starting in John chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and be opening those up to John chapter 13. And in John chapter 13, we have the story of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And for time purposes, we're not going to read that entire story. I'm going to do a little summary, and then we're going to read a part of it. Um, And then we'll jump ahead to 1 John. Uh, But in John chapter 13, we have Jesus washing his disciples' feet. And you might be familiar with the story already, uh, but it's a pretty simple story. Jesus decides that he is going to wash his disciples' feet. And I'm sure you've, you've, you've heard it explained to you before. Uh, washing people's feet in this day was not a uh, desirable task. You got to think, this was uh, a long time ago. There were no paved roads. People wore sandals all the time. Uh, people used roads as toilets, or at least they put their, uh, their waste on the street. So people were walking in all kinds of filth all the time. People's feet were filthy. So to wash someone's feet... While today would not be a fun task, back then would be even worse of a task. So Jesus decides that he's going to wash his disciples' feet. And this is one of the lowest roles that anyone could play uh, by washing people's feet. So Jesus goes around, and when he starts washing his apostles' feet, um, you get to a part in the story where Peter's like, no, there's no way that you are going to wash my feet. Peter knew who Jesus was. His apostles knew that, okay, this guy is special. Uh, they were starting to understand and starting to comprehend that that, that he is God and that he is Jesus, that he is God's uh, son. They were starting to understand that. Uh, so to have God himself wash your feet, not something that you want. So Peter tries to stop him. Jesus tells him, no, I'm going to do it. So Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And we're going to pick up in John chapter 13, starting in verse 12. John 13, starting in verse 12. And it says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Jesus talking, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So Jesus issues this awesome challenge for his apostles. And he says, you're right. I am your Lord. I am your teacher. And if I am that, if I am your Lord, and if I am your teacher, and I'm willing to get on my hands and knees and wash your feet, what should you be doing for each other? You should be doing the same thing. You should be doing more. You should be loving each other. After this great lesson where Jesus challenges his apostles uh, to, to wash each other's feet, to be servants to one another, if we skip ahead, this is the same night, this is the same evening, same, same time frame, and uh, John chapter 13, starting in verse 34, this is really what's going to kick us off into 1 John, okay? John chapter 13, starting in verse 34, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So Jesus has this this incredible evening where he gets his apostles together. He washes their feet. It's this great example of servanthood. It's this great example of love. It's this great example of how they're supposed to be treating each other. And then after that, he gives them this new commandment that says, you are to love other people the way that I have loved you. 
Okay, with that in mind, let's now skip ahead to our study in 1 John. So we're going to be in 1 John chapter 2. Uh, our portion for Scripture this week is 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. So we're going to read this whole passage, 1 John chapter 2, verses 7 through 11. Then we'll go back through it, and we'll really talk about, okay, well, how does John 13 tie into this portion of Scripture? Okay, so John, 1 John chapter 2 now, verses 7 through 11, it says, Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes." Okay, uh, maybe you caught already how this ties in together. Okay, so let's go back to the beginning of the passage um, and talk about or, and really try to explore what John is talking about here and see how it applies to our lives today. Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment. So, Jesus, or so John here um, starts off saying we have a commandment that is both old and at the same time is new. It's a commandment that is both old and new. What do you think that commandment is? you have any idea what John is alluding to, this commandment that is both old and new? The commandment that John is alluding to is the commandment to love. And he is calling back to this idea in John chapter 13, where he says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You. So this is an old commandment in that love has always been part of the equation when it comes to God and his people, right? Uh, in the Old Testament, in the law with the Israelites, love was, was part of, of that law. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. This were, these were laws that the Israelites had if they wanted to be in a relationship with God. Love God, love your neighbor. So love has always been part of the plan. It's an old commandment. At the same time, it's an old commandment to the people John, John's writing to, because as long as these people have been Christians, they have been taught about love probably by John himself. So it's an old commandment in that love has always been part of the plan when it comes to God and his people. It's an old commandment in that um, in that as long as these people have been Christians, they have been taught about love. So how is this also a new commandment? How can something be both old and new? Uh, I want you to think about maybe phones for a second. Uh, the phone is an old invention, right? It's something that's been around for a long time. Uh, but at the same time, when you look at your iPhone or you look at your smartphone, uh, that is something that is new. So while the phone is old, it is new in that there's a guy named Steve Jobs that came around and he said, I'm going to completely change how the phone is viewed. Uh, Steve Jobs was this master of technology. And with that mastery, he completely changed how the phone was perceived. Uh, another example we could think about is Steve Spurrier. Um, we'll stick with Steve, Steve Jobs, Steve Spurrier. Um, Steve Spurrier, who in the 90s changed the game of football. Uh, he, being this offensive mastermind, uh, created this new offense that was known as the fun and gun. So he took this old game of football and then he added in this new offense that completely changed the game of football and how people would be running offenses for the rest of football history. Um, so we have these masterminds. We have these masters, master of technology, master of offensive football, and they completely made their uh, field new. In the hands of a master, an old experience can become something new. Have you figured out who the master of love is? Yeah, it's, it's Jesus. Jesus is the master of love, and through Jesus, he completely made love totally new. 
uh, if you have your Bibles, you can flip back to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. Um, in Matthew chapter 5, it is Jesus' sermon on the mount, and Jesus is going to be presenting some of his new teachings in Matthew chapter 5. And he's going to take things from the Old Testament, from the law, and he's going to change them, and he's going to improve upon them. Before he does, he gives a warning. He says in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the law. I didn't come away to do away with the prophets. I came to fulfill. I came to complete. I came to make better what you already knew in the Old Testament. And if love has always been part of God's plan, if love was in the law and the prophets, then that love was not fulfilled yet. That love was not complete yet. But when Jesus came to earth and he lived the life that he did and he died on the cross, he completed that love. He made that love something new, something greater, something that while the Israelites might have had an idea of what love was, when Jesus came to earth, he completely changed it and he completely made love new and better. So Jesus was the master of love. Well, how did Jesus make love new? How did he make love new? Um, Love became new under Jesus in the extent that it would reach. Before Jesus, under the law, love reached only the Israelites, and not even all the Israelites. Love only reached the Israelites who were practicing the right rules and the right rituals at the right time, right? It wasn't just if I was an Israelite, I had the love of God. It was, I'm an Israelite, and I'm doing all these rituals, and I'm living under this law. And if I do, then I'm exposed to the love of God. But with Jesus, he came into the world and he brought love to the entire world. He brought God's love to all sinners. It wasn't about rules and rituals anymore. It was about Jesus. That's what we talked about last week when we talked about uh, in 1 John 2, verse 2. It says, he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus made love new because he brought um he extended God's love to everyone, to the entire world. He tore down uh, the boundaries of love and made it available for everyone. He brought uh, love and hope to the entire world. Love also became new under Jesus because he was literally the physical embodiment of love. Jesus was the physical embodiment of love. Think about it. When we go through the Gospels, Everything that we see that Jesus did was motivated by love. Um, he didn't care if people were Jew or Gentile or Samaritan. He didn't care if people were rich or poor, if they were um, a tax collector or not. He didn't care if he didn't care what family they came from. All he cared about was how he could love them. Jesus was the physical embodiment of love. Jesus being the physical embodiment of love brought love wherever he went. Think about that. Wherever he went, Jesus brought the love of God with him. And this scripture calls us to do the same thing. Wherever Jesus went, he brought love. This scripture calls us to do the exact same thing. Look at it. Look at verse uh, 8. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you. We bring this commandment with us, too. We bring the love of Jesus everywhere that we go. Jesus commands us back in John chapter 13 to love one another as I have loved you to love one another as I have loved you. Well, how did Jesus love? Right? Because that's our commandment. We love like Jesus loved. And what's interesting, when I, when I was first writing this lesson, when I was first thinking about it, I was looking at, well, how did Jesus love everybody? How did Jesus love the crowds? Well, he had compassion on them, and he brought uh, healing and forgiveness to the crowds. I was looking at how does he love everybody as a whole, but really our commandment that Jesus gave was to love people the way that Jesus loved his apostles. It wasn't just how did Jesus love everybody. How did Jesus love his apostles? 
that's kind of a harder question to answer. Most of the Gospels are filled with how Jesus loved other people and how Jesus loves the masses. And there's really not as much personal detail about how Jesus did love his apostles. But I think we can look at the principles of who Jesus was and we can get ideas for how exactly he loved his apostles. Because remember, that was a commandment in John chapter 13, verses 34. He said, love, uh, love one another as I, Jesus, have loved you. So how did Jesus love his apostles? What do you think? How do you think Jesus loved his apostles? Jesus, first off, spent time with his apostles, right? Um, not accounted in scripture is all the road trips. I mean, Jesus started his ministry with his apostles and was with them from that point on for three years, every day. They were on a constant road trip together. And we don't get the accounts of, of them walking down the road together. We don't get the accounts of them camping together every night. Uh, I, I seriously doubt that when it came to Jesus being with his apostles, that it was, okay, the apostles' tents were over here and Jesus' tent was over here and he had to invite you to come over and, or that it was the apostles' fire was over here and Jesus' fire was over here or Jesus ate this and the apostles had to eat this. No, knowing what we know about Jesus, him spending time with them was not just, okay, the master is over there and we are over here, but he was really spending time experiencing all of life with them. So Jesus spent time with his apostles. Jesus also poured himself into his apostles. Uh, it wasn't just spending time, but it was the quality of time that was spent with him. Maybe you have somebody in your life who you feel like really poured themselves into you. One example that I have for my life is uh, my uncle Kyle. My uncle Kyle is my dad's brother. Uh, he is... If anything, as we were growing up, or even now in my life today, was messed up in our house, first call we would make is Uncle Kyle. And we would call him, and pretty much no matter what, he would find a way to be there that day or the next day or as soon as he could and, and help us fix things. And he could have come in, and I mean, he was at my house just a couple weeks ago fixing something for me. And anytime he does that, he could just come in and fix it and leave, but he comes in and he shows me exactly what he's going to do. He tells me how he's going to do it. As he's doing it, he has me help him, and he shows me so that I can know exactly what he's doing and so that I can learn from him. And as he's doing that, I know why he's doing it. It's not because he wants me to call him less so that I'm able to fix things myself and, and not rely on him, but it's he wants to involve me. He wants to... That's his way of showing his love is, is showing that he cares for me and doing things for me, but also teaching me. And he really pours himself into me as he's doing that. And I think that's exactly what Jesus did in his ministry with his apostles. It wasn't just that he let his apostles witness him do these things, but he also taught his apostles how he was doing this, how he was doing these things. So Jesus poured himself into his apostles. Jesus performed acts of service for his apostles, just like we looked at in John chapter 13 when he washed their feet. It wasn't just that he was their master and their Lord and they were to serve him, but Jesus also at all times was willing to serve his apostles. That's a great example for us about us being willing to serve other people. Jesus forgave his apostles. Jesus uh, was, was dealing with 12 human beings, 12 men who did have sin in their life and who failed and who had shortcomings, and I'm sure wronged Jesus many times. Uh, the most obvious time that he forgave his apostles was the apostle of Peter, when Peter uh, denied Jesus during the time where Jesus needed Peter the most. Peter denied him, the ultimate betrayal. And yet after Jesus was resurrected, uh, we have evidence that Jesus forgave Peter. Um, Jesus also sacrificed himself for his apostles. Not only did he sacrifice himself on the cross, the ultimate sacrifice, but I imagine Jesus daily sacrificed himself for his apostles. He daily was thinking, what can I do for my apostles to help them? So if we are called to love other people, to love our Christian brothers and sisters as Jesus loved his apostles, these are the kinds of things that we need to be doing for our Christian brothers and sisters. We have to spend time with our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
And if I ask you the question, do you love your brothers and sisters uh, the way that Jesus loved his apostles? Our initial response is, yeah, of course, I love my brothers and sisters the way that Jesus loved his apostles. In which I would ask the question, how? How are you loving your brothers and sisters the way that Jesus loved his apostles? We have to be more than just people who worship together in the same room. I think a lot of times that's not just not saying us here at Rainbow, but I think a lot of times collectively Christianity as a whole, most of the time in our congregations, we are just people who happen to worship together in the same room. And we have to be more than that. We have to be more than just people who congregate twice a week or once a week to worship together in the same room. We have to be people who, like Jesus, spend time with our brothers and our sisters. We have to be people who are willing to pour ourselves into our brothers and our sisters. We have to be people who are willing to perform acts of service. Thank goodness we don't have to wash feet anymore, but I should still have my eyes open for opportunities to serve my brothers and sisters just as Jesus served his apostles by washing his feet. We have to be willing to forgive our brothers and sisters, not when they perform, uh, not when they sin and they go forward before the congregation to ask for forgiveness, but I have to be willing to forgive my brothers and sisters when they have just common everyday slights that might offend me or hurt my feelings, I have to be willing to forgive them. And then, of course, forgive them also if they have sin in their life. I have to be willing to sacrifice myself for my brothers and sisters. And sometimes that might mean I sacrifice my own hard-earned money for my brothers and sisters. Sometimes that means I sacrifice my time for my brothers and sisters. Sometimes that might even mean I sacrifice maybe time with my family so that I can be my physical family, so that I can be with my spiritual family. Jesus' call for us to love each other like he loved his apostles is not just something that sounds good. It's not just something that, yes, I love my brothers and sisters the way that Jesus loved his apostles. It's something that we have to do. It's something that we have to seek out and actually perform. Do we love our brothers and sisters the same way that Jesus loved his apostles? It's a scary question to answer, but it's one that we have to. That commandment, this commandment that is both old and new, this commandment of love, of the way that we treat each other, is such an important commandment. Uh, and we'll, we'll look into just how important it is as we continue. Okay, so we're, let's, let's pick back up in 1 John chapter 2. We're going to start reading in verse 9. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. John here is trying to express to us how important it is to love our brothers and sisters. He makes it very simple. There are two options. If you love your brothers and sisters, congratulations, you are in the light. If you don't have love for your brothers and sisters, if you are not seeking out love the way that Jesus sought out love for his apostles, if you're not seeking that kind of love out for your brothers and sisters, the passage says that we are in darkness. Only two options. There's no twilight here. There's no middle ground here. It's you love your brothers and sisters and you're, and you're in the light, or you don't love your brothers and sisters and you're in the darkness. Flip back with me to John chapter 13. Last time we'll flip back there. Okay. Flip back with me to John chapter 13. Let's read this commandment that we have from Jesus again. We're also going to read the verse that follows it this time, and it really stresses the importance of our love for our brothers and and sisters. So John in 1 John has, has already talked about, listen, if you love your brothers, you're in the light. If you don't, you're in the darkness. Okay. Jesus talks about that similarly in John chapter 13, starting in verse 34, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. All right. Verse 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. If we do not have love for one another, there is no evidence that we belong to Jesus. If I'm not someone who is seeking out to love my brothers and sisters, people that I go to church with, 
there is no evidence that I'm a disciple. There is no evidence that I'm a Christian. There is no evidence that I belong to Jesus Christ, that I'm part of his family, that I am am involved in that same kind of love. I cannot stress how important this commandment is. Jesus calls us to be people who love each other. And if we are not, we are in darkness. If we are not people who actively seek out to love our brothers and our sisters the way that he loved his apostles, then we're in darkness. We're not disciples of him. There is no evidence that we belong to Jesus. To put it bluntly, you are not a Christian if you do not love your brothers and your sisters. Um, Verse 11 says, But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You might come to church every time the doors are open. Maybe you're someone, you come to church every time the doors are open and yet you still feel like something is missing. I'm here all the time. I worship God every week and yet I still feel like something is missing from my spiritual life. I still feel lost even though I'm here all the time. Can I challenge you, if you're that kind of person, that you still feel lost even though you you think you might be doing all the right things, even though I'm here, I still feel lost at times. That's what this passage is about. Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going, has no path, is lost, is in darkness. A reason that you might still feel lost even though you're here at church all the time might be because of the love that you don't have for your brothers and sisters. You might just be coming here, checking off the box that I worshiped, but not taking the time to see who am I worshiping with? How am I serving the people that I am worshiping with? This commandment to love is such a powerful one. Aren't you glad that we serve a God who his highest commandment is to love one another. There are lots of other religions in the world, lots of other quote unquote gods in the world. Their highest commandment has nothing to do with love. But our God, his highest commandment is all about how we love one another, how we love him. And God knows if we are people who are filled with his love, who are filled with loving one another, What a blessing it is, not only for the people in our lives, but also what a blessing it is for our own lives. I want to challenge you this week to really think about this commandment. This commandment can be summed up in, do you bring love everywhere that you go? Jesus made love totally new and that he embodied love and he brought it to people. And we are called to do the same thing. We are called to embody the love of God, to embody the love of Jesus Christ, and then to bring that love to other people people. And if we don't, we're not being followers of him. So I want you to think about this week. Am I actively bringing the love of God to other people? If you're not, I really hope that you'll actually think about, well, what can I do? What can I do to bring the love of God to other people? How can I be a servant to God this week? What can I do to change to be better? I really like, uh, I wasn't planning on talking about this, but since it's here, be transformed. Be transformed. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 is this wonderful challenge that we have to be transformed. And when you're a Christian, that transformation process is ever go. It's ever ongoing. Uh, We are always seeking to be the best version of ourselves, the version that God wants us to be, the version that Jesus wants us to be. Uh, So my challenge for you this week, be transformed. Be the kind of people that bring love to every situation, to everybody that we come in contact with with. Aren't you thankful we serve a God of love? Aren't you thankful that we have uh, this wonderful book that tells us all about the love of God and how we can bring that love to other people? Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for this opportunity that we have to study your word, to uh, learn from you. Father, we're thankful for your love, the love that was embodied in Jesus, the love that Jesus brought to the entire world. Father, I pray that that we also embody that love, that we uh, 
see Jesus's example, that we see how Jesus loved people and that we seek to love people the exact same way. Father, I'm thankful for our congregation here at Rainbow, for my brothers and sisters that worship uh, here. I pray that we all can be unified, that we all can love each other, that we all can be willing to open up our hearts to each other, and that we can grow together as we are growing closer to you, God. We're thankful uh, for Jesus, for his sacrifice, um, for the love that he shows us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.